Hello everyone, and welcome to the first in a number of videos covering chapter 14, which is going to talk about the brain and the cranial nerves. Uh, so this is a very in-depth chapter, so one video would have been far, far too long. So just make sure to watch every video. Uh, this is video one. So, you know, it's interesting to think about the fact that when we say that the brain is the most complex thing in the known universe, that it's the brain itself giving that high opinion of itself. Brain function is so critical to what it means to be human and alive that brain cessation is actually what classifies someone as being clinically deceased, even when other organs are still functioning. With its hundreds of neural pools and perhaps trillions of synapses, the brain performs tasks that are still beyond our current understanding. Just some facts about the brain. It weighs about 1,600 grams or three and a half pounds in men and just a little bit less in women, about 1,450 grams in women. And there's over 100 billion neurons. Now, don't worry. It's the complexity that gives the brain its power, not its size. And all the way back to the time of Hippocrates, um, people started to figure out that it was the brain that was important. Um, before then, people thought that it was like a thermostat that sort of controlled blood temperature. But uh, Hippocrates, he said that men ought to know that from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joy, laughter and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears. And he was correct. And now you're going to learn about why. So let's talk about some major landmarks of the brain. First, some new directional terms here. When talking about the brain, um, we, in, in other parts of the central nervous system anatomy are, anatomy, are rostral and caudal. Rostral means toward the nose, and caudal means toward the tail. And that's great when you're looking at things like a rat. But in humans, as we are, as we stand up vertically, Rostral means towards the forehead, and caudal means toward the spinal cord. The brain can also be conceptually broken down into three major portions. The forebrain, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. So let's talk about these a little bit further. First is the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the most prominent part of the forebrain. It constitutes about 83% of the brain's volume, and it consists of a pair of half globes called the cerebral hemispheres. Each hemisphere is marked by thick folds called gyri or gyrus individually, and they're separated by shallow grooves called sulci or sulcus. Um, let's move on. The longitudinal, longitudinal cerebral fissure is a deep median groove that separates the right and the left hemispheres from each other. At the bottom of the fissure, the hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum, which is a thick bundle of nerve fibers that has a distinctive C shape. The cerebellum is the next part. It occupies the posterior cranial fossa, interior, inferior to the cerebrum, separated from it by the transverse cerebral fissure. It's the second largest region of the brain, which only constitutes 10% of the volume, but almost or more than 50% of the neurons. Pretty cool. Then the brainstem, which is all of the brain except the cerebrum and the cerebellum, and its components are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. In a living person, the brainstem is oriented like a vertical stalk, with the forebrain perched on top like a mushroom cap. Caudally, the, brain end, the brainstem ends at the foramen magnum of the skull, and the central nervous system continues down as the spinal cord. Here's what that looks like. Again, rostral and caudal. You can look and see the central sulcus, uh, different gyrus, um, a gyri or a singular gyrus, the lateral sulcus. Here is the temporal lobe. We'll talk more about this the brain stem down to the spinal cord. Here's the cerebellum. And this entire thing, what most people would consider the brain, is actually the cerebrum. This whole thing is considered the frontal lobe. Here you see a central, the central sulcus, 
the parietal lobe, and behind it, the occipital lobe. Again, these two hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum. Let's take a look at the corpus callosum. You can see the corpus callosum in its distinct C shape. In here, you also find the thalamus, and here is the temporal lobe. Here's the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, part of the brainstem. Again, back here is the cerebellum. Okay, now let's talk about gray and white matter in the brain. We've already talked about it in the spinal cord. The brain, just like the spinal cord, is composed both of gray and white matter. Gray matter is the seat of the neurosomas, dendrites, and synapses, and it forms a surface layer called the cortex, which you find over the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And there are also deeper masses called nuclei, which are surrounded by white matter. The white matter lies deep to the cortical gray matter in most of the brain. This is the opposite from the relationship in the spinal cord, if you remember. But just like the spinal cord, the white matter is composed of tracts or bundles of axons, which here connect one part of the brain to the other and then to the spinal cord. Okay, remember, the brain is enveloped by three membranes called the meninges. These lie between the nervous tissue and the bone. They protect the brain and they provide a structural framework for the arteries and the veins. And just like the spinal cord, the meninges are the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Okay, ventricles. Ventricles are the four inner chambers within the brain. There are two lateral ventricles, which are the lar uh, largest and most rostral. They form an arc in each cerebral hemisphere. The intraventricular foramen is a tiny pore that connects each lateral ventricle to a third ventricle. The third ventricle is a narrow medial space inferior to the corpus callosum. And the cerebral aqueduct is a canal that runs through the midbrain and connects the third to the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is a smaller triangular chamber between the pons and the cerebellum, and this connects to the central canal that runs through the spinal cord. Uh, the choroid plexus is a spongy mass of blood capillaries that are found on the floor of each ventricle. The ependyma is a type of neuroglia that lines ventricles and covers the choroid plexus. These cells resemble cuboidal epithelium, but they aren't, and they produce cerebrospinal fluid. Here's what this looks like. Here's the choroid plexus. You can see it there in pink. Let's talk a little bit more about cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is a clear, colorless liquid that fills the ventricles and the canals of the central nervous system and also bathes the external surface of the central nervous system. The reasons that you need cerebrospinal fluid are for buoyancy of the brain, which allows the brain to attain its considerable size without being impaired by its own weight. If it rested heavily on the floor of the cranium, the pressure would kill the nervous tissue. Also for protection, it protects the brain from striking the cranium when the head is jolted. Obviously, there are limits to this, such as shaken child syndrome and concussions that occur from severe jolting. And also chemical stability. The flow of the cerebral spinal fluid rinses away the metabolic wastes from nervous tissue and homeostatically regulates its chemical environment. How do we get blood to the brain? Well, there are primarily two sets of arteries the internal carotid arteries, and the vertebral arteries. Um, the brain constitutes only about 2% of your body weight, yet it gets 15% of the blood flow and consumes 20% of the oxygen and glucose. That's because these neurons have an extreme ATP demand. Think about all of the processes that they are doing. A mere 10 seconds of oxygen deprivation can make you lose consciousness and one to two minutes could impair cognitive function greatly. And if you get to four minutes, this could cause irreparable brain damage. Now, it's really important now that we talk about the blood-brain barrier. Because despite how critical blood flow is to the brain, it also carries things that are damaging to it. Antibodies, macrophages, bacterial toxins. These uh, things could damage brain tissue and damaged brain tissue is irreplaceable. So consequently, there is a brain barrier system that strictly regulates what can get to the brain from the bloodstream. 
The blood-brain barrier consists of tight junctions between the endothelial cells that form the capillary walls. And this ensures that anything leaving the blood has to pass through the cells and not between them. Remember, we saw that capillaries allow things normally to pass through through simply through diffusion. However, because we have these tight uh, junctions, they will no longer be able to move through the capillaries through the walls, they'll have to move through the ends. This barrier now becomes a selective membrane, where some substances, particularly if they're lipid soluble, will pass easily from the blood to the brain. Things like water, glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, heroin, and other anesthetics. But most charged ions do not pass easily, and proteins and most antibiotics do not pass at all. All right, let's keep moving. So as we continue our study of the brain structure, we will proceed in a caudal to rostral direction. We're gonna begin with the hindbrain and its relatively simple functions, and we'll progress to the forebrain, the place where complex functions like thought, memory, and emotion occur. So here we go. The medulla oblongata is located at the base of your brain, where the brain stem connects the brain to your spinal cord. It plays an essential role in passing messages between your spinal cord and brain, and it's also essential for regulating your cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Let's start with the pons. The pons appears as a broad anterior bulge rostral to the medulla. Posteriorly, it consists of two pairs of thick stalks called the cerebella peduncles. The midbrain is a short segment of brainstem that connects the hindbrain and the forebrain. It contains the cerebral aqueduct. Here's the brainstem in its entire glory. Here you can see the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. Sitting on top of it is the diencephalon. We'll talk about that in a second. All of the ascending and descending fibers that connect the brain and the spinal cord have to pass through the medulla. The reticular formation is a loose web of gray matter that runs vertically through all levels of the brainstem. It occupies the space between the white fiber tracts and the brainstem nuclei. It has connections with many areas of the cerebrum, and there are more than a hundred small neural networks that are without distinct boundaries. This has a lot of the cardiac, the vasomotor, and the respiratory centers, things that control and process signals. Okay, let's move on to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the largest part of the hindbrain, and it's the second largest part of the brain as a whole. It's the second largest region of the brain, which is 10% of the brain by volume, but 50% of the neurons. There are two primary functions of the cerebellum, adjusting the postural muscles of the body, which coordinates rapid automatic adjustments that maintain balance and equilibrium, and programming and fine-tuning movements controlled at the subconscious and conscious level. This refines learned movement patterns by regulating activity of both the pyramidal and extrapyramidal motor pathways of the cerebral cortex, and it compares motor commands with sensory info from the muscles and joints and performs any adjustments so that the movement itself is smooth. The cerebellum could be permanently damaged by things like trauma or stroke or temporar temporarily affected by drugs like alcohol. This would result in something called ataxia, which is the disturbance of balance. Okay, let's talk about the diencephalon. The diencephalon forms the central core of the forebrain. There are three paired structures in the diencephalon, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the epithalamus, and also we'll talk about the pituitary gland. Let's talk about the thalamus. It's 80% of the diencephalon. It's a sensory relay station where sensory signals can be edited, sorted, and routed. It also has profound input on motor and cognitive function via the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. But not all of the functions have even been discovered yet. There's still more to study here. The hypothalamus is, um, the functions here include autonomic regulatory center influencing the heart rate, the blood pressure and the respiratory rate, GI tract motility, and the diameter of your pupils. 
It also in, is involved in emotional response like fear, loathing, and pleasure. And it also is involved in like sex drive and hunger drive, the regulation of body temperature, the regulation of food intake, regulation of water balance and thirst, regulation of the circadian rhythm, sleep cycles, hormonal control, including releasing hormones that influence hormonal secretion from the pituitary gland, and it can also release oxytocin and vasopressin. This is found immediately inferior to the hypothalamus. Uh, no, sorry, but what, it, what is found immediately inferior to the hypothalamus is the optic chiasma. It's the part of the brain where the optic nerves cross. Okay, the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland has two functional components, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Um, the anterior pituitary is the adenohyphosis, which is primarily the glandular tissue, and it synthesizes protein hormones. The posterior pituitary is the neurohyphosis. Hyphophys, it's a hard word there. These are primarily neurosecretory cells, which means their cell bodies are in the hypothalamus, and they secrete peptide hormones, and some of them support glial cells. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the pituitary gland. It's connected to the hypothalamus by the infundibulum, and it has a vascular linkage where in the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, where there are two capillary beds, and this is known as the hypophysial portal system. And then its nervous linkage is the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary, and you have here hypothalamic neuron, neuron axons in this 